All right, so um, before I dive into this project, I do want to state that I did decide to use um, MongoDB Atlas to basically create a cluster, and I'm going to try to connect the application to this. To give you some background information of this, like I literally just created an account, and then I just walked through the tutorial and clicked to create a cluster for free, and then like click next, next, next. They have this like cool little get started guide down here. So we're basically at this point, connect to your cluster, and what we want to do is we're trying to connect that service that we have set up. By the way, this is my MongoDB password, which I'll probably change after this video. But but what we need to do is we need to try to have Mongoose connect to that um, cluster. So I haven't done this before. I haven't worked with MongoDB Atlas, but I'm assuming it's super straightforward. So let's just try to do that. If we click on this connect button, that is going to show us this prompt here. And I'm going to click connect your application, which is going to show you like some snippet of what you can use. You can also like include the full code if you want to actually like use their driver code, but we're using Mongoose. So we'll just, just copy all this and we are going to basically paste it directly in here. Right, so I probably should have started this whole series out with MongoDB Atlas because it's easier to get started as a beginner, but I mean, this, this, this is fine. So again, this, we have to replace this password. You'll notice here the password is in like brackets, but we actually want to pass in this password that we kind of created during that MongoDB Atlas setup. So I'm going to paste that in for now, and I am going to refactor this in just a second to put this in a .env file so that it's hidden from GitHub and from everyone else. So first of all, let's just see if this works. If I go back, um, I ne again, I never used this before, so we're going to see what this actually provides us. Like, can we actually query data here? Well, let's just try to go to the UI and make sure we have our network tab open. And let's see if we log in with one of those admin users. Let's see, this is failing, unauthorized, because I probably haven't even created a user. So let me go to register. One thing I noticed is that we don't have the register in the URL here. We might want to do that. So I'm just going to make a new user called admin at example.com, and the password will be 123456. Register that user. Um, and remember, the way that you have admin privileges is you have to actually go and like modify your data to have a role. So let's see if there's a way to do that. I don't know if there is. What is data lake? Let's just click around and see like what they have. Probably you go to databases. Let's see. Probably browse collections. Oh, actually, if you go back, let me just show you. So I think our server's working fine. And the reason I think that is because you can see here, it said that we have one connection. So my local laptop is connecting to this remote cluster. And then it said we got some data in and some data out as well. So let's go back to browse collections and let's see what MongoDB Atlas provides us. So we can actually look at the things that we've created. I can go to users, it loads the documents. And you can see here we have like an admin user here. So let's just go ahead and edit this and I'm gonna add a role. How do you do this? Let's see, let's see, I click the plus, add a field after password. I wish this just had like a JSON editor, but it doesn't. So let's just do that and click update. So at that point, I should be able to hopefully log out, log back in, and again, my local running service is connected to that remote server now. So I should be able to log in and we should, let me just save this password we should be able to actually like go to the create product page. All right, so that's all set up correctly. Um, I hope that all made sense. And you can also connect to this remote server using that MongoDB plugin or extension I found. So let's just try this to make sure this is all working fine. I'm gonna say connect with advanced settings. I'm gonna go to, let's just paste that all in and see what happens. Um, I might have to like do some, you know, let me go back and see what happens if I just click connect. I'll paste in the connection string here. That might be easier. And it says connecting and then we're connected and we can actually go through to my first database. Although I don't know why it's called my first database. I don't know if that really matters. 
Maybe that's what we set up when we were trying to set up Mongo. But I can actually do the same thing. I can just like look through my schemas, look through my documents. Um, yeah. So now we have two ways to browse our Mongo data. And we can edit it here or we can edit it. Let's see if we can actually edit it here. Let's, let's change the password. Let's add a role or something with like an exclamation mark and save it. And let's go back to Atlas, refresh this page. Again, sorry, I'm just playing around with stuff to try to learn. This is how I like learning stuff. I just play around. So you see there's an exclamation mark here now. So you can edit that data either in this UI or in VS Code directly, whatever is easiest. But anyway, let's just, let's just move forward. But like I said, this password is hard coded. There's two issues with this string. First of all, the password is hard coded, which is a security issue if you commit this to GitHub. And then secondly, the URL for this whole cluster could change, right? Let's say in the future you decide that you want to point to a different Mongo URL. Well, right now it's all hard coded in code. So I would just take this whole string out and put this whole string directly in a .env file. Some people, like maybe you just put the username and password, but honestly, if you change your different hosts, like let's say you don't use MongoDB Atlas anymore, or you change your database name, you're gonna have to change like so many different things in the string. So I would just recommend taking this whole string out and we're gonna pretend that's coming from an environment variable. So I'm gonna say process env mongo uh, db url. All right, so save that, it's gonna crash. Now, if you don't know what an environment variable is, it's just something that's on your local operating system that your applications can load in to get like a key value um, set up. So again, we just wanna put that string in like a .env file. So I think I could just make a dot um, env here. And inside that .env, we are gonna paste that string in a key value set up like this. So I'm gonna do this. All right, so that's the first step. The next step is we actually need to include a package so that node can actually load this in. So I think if I go to npm and search for .env, there should be a package. It's pretty straightforward to get going. Um, you just install .env like this. So let's go back to my bash. Go to my server directory, run that. And that'll set it up and install it. And now you just need to do this. So whenever you run this, basically it's going to load in that .env file here and put those on your environment variables. Again, it's, it's pretty straightforward to get set up. So let's just verify this works. Now, if I were to go back to my app, we should be connected to that Atlas. And you notice that we have that all abstracted away inside this .env file. So let's just verify we can actually do something. So I'm gonna say like testing cost is, actually I'm gonna say eggs. Cost is 4.99, description yummy, eggs. Click submit, hopefully this works. It seems like it did something, although I would probably have liked it to give me some UX user feedback. But if we go back to the main page, you can see that the eggs actually showed up here. So that works. Um, um, so another thing that people like to do is they will put an example .env. So I think it's like .env sample. Um, I think it's like this. I don't know how people actually name it, but really all that matters is that you have this sample committed to your database or to, to GitHub, but you don't want this .env to ever get to GitHub because it might have some secret codes here. So let's just go into gitignore of the server folder. And I'm gonna add .env here so that it never commits this file. The other file is fine. This is like someone can look at this and see like um, an example of what they need to do. All right, so I hope that all makes sense by now. Um, by the way, um, I had to install like OBS and have like a different setup with my recording. So if it sounds a little bit different or more echoey or something, I apologize, but just we just have to bear with it for this part of the series and for the future for a little bit. All right, so another thing I wanna do is, like I said, like when you log in as admin, or if you're not logged in, there's no register button. So I think we should add a register button to the top URL here. So let's go to the header, do a fuzzy search with command P, go to header. And what we want to do is we want to basically just add another link called register. So I'm going to say, if you're not logged in, you're going to go to a register page and I'm going to show a register link. Um, now you could probably do some code cleanup here because these are both like duplicate Boolean logics, but I like to keep them separated so that you can easily just move them around. 
But if you wanted to nest them in one big like, I don't know, is not logged in and then show those two links, you could do that. All right, so let's see what happens here. So now we have a register link here that shows up if you're not logged in. And if you try to log in as an admin, that register link goes away. So that should be working pretty good. I think there's something else that I wanted to add. So if you're logged in as an admin, I want to have a create product button here so I can easily go and create more products. So let's add another page. So if we're going to say is admin, we're going to go to a create product page. I'm going to say create product. And I'm going to put this, I don't know, just in the middle somewhere. And again, remember, this is like that custom hook that we in created. So we need to make sure we bring that in. So I'm going to say const is admin equals use is admin. Auto import that, save it. Get rid of that ESLint error. And now we should see a create products link. We can click it, it goes to that page. Another thing I didn't like is when we created the product, we didn't actually redirect back to the dashboard. I think it'd be nice if we redirected back to the dashboard so we can see the products list that we just created. So let's go to the create products page. Uh, let me show you something that's really cool. Um, I don't know if it's gonna work very well, but if you go to your React components tab, sometimes when your project is large, you don't know what component is in which file. So you can actually like hover over the the DOM and kind of go up and figure out, okay, where's this coming from? So this is coming from a create products page. Of course, I just lost it. Where'd it go? Here it is. Right? So what you can do is you can go and find the create products page. So that's why I like naming my files to match the components names so that you can easily fuzzy search. But sometimes if you have a different name JSX file, that's exporting a different like constant. You can do a full project search and typically this is like what I like to search for. I just do like the name equals and that'll show up or you could just do this. But yeah, that's just a little, little tip I like to do. All right, so we're on the create product page. And again, what I wanted to do is when you create a product, I want to redirect them back to the dashboard. So the admin should be redirected back to the dashboard. So how do we do that? We've done that many times already in this application. You just need to bring in a uh, history so I'm going to say use history. That is a custom hook that's provided by React Router. And then you can just say history.push. And I'm going to go to the dashboard. So let's just try to add some milk. The 599 inscription is yummy milk. Let's see if this works. Click submit. We go back to the dashboard, and our product is showing up down here. Um, in all honesty, like as an admin user, you don't really need to add things to your cart. I think it would make sense to just get rid of that cart link and get rid of the add to cart button. I don't know. Maybe I'm just getting too off topic here, but let's just do that real quick just in case. So if you're not an admin, then we don't need to show. I'm sorry. If you're logged in and you're not an admin, then we could show that cart button. And then also the add to cart button here, probably get rid of that. So let's go to the products page. Let's find the add to cart button by doing a search. You see it's here. I want to say if you're logged in and you're not an admin, then that's when you want to show that. Because I mean, if you're an admin, there's no reason to have a cart and adding stuff to it. Really, you should have like a different user to kind of verify these things. All right, so we've we've done you know a little bit of work here. I think the next thing we could do is like I don't like how there's no images showing up here. We should probably allow an admin to attach or upload an image to the back end when they're creating a product or editing a product. So let's go to the create product page and try to implement that. Hopefully it's not too hard. So typically in Node, we're gonna start with maybe the back end and come back, or maybe we do the front end. Who knows? Let's let's kind of close some stuff and let's start fresh. So on the front end, let's just start the front end. Sorry, I'm jumping around. We need to add like an, an image input box, basically. So let's go to the client and go to the create products page. And we want to basically add another form group. I'm gonna copy this. And at the very bottom, let's just go to like the last form group. We're gonna add another one and that's gonna be called image. And I'm going to say that's going to be a type of file. And I might have to go to the bootstrap docs to like refresh my memory on this works, but 
Um, I don't know if this is going to work out of the box, but let's just try to do that and see if this actually works. Now we have an image thing that shows up and we should be able to select an image. Let me just download an image of like eggs image. <clears throat> Save this image. I'll just put this on my desktop for now. So if I click on this, go to my desktop, I should see those eggs. And we can hopefully submit this. Let's see what else we need. We need to do eggs, 499, good eggs. All right, so let's try clicking submit. I think there's some more work we have to do, but let's click submit and see what happens. And let's go to the network tab and see what got sent over the wire. Honestly, this is how I like the code. I just like to experiment and see what happens. Um, it looks like it did add the file here, but on the back end, I don't think we have access to the file. Like if we go to server, oh, here's a server right here. Um, we need to actually be able to process that. So we might have to do some changes of how this whole thing works, but we'll figure this out. It won't take too much time. So on the server, let's go ahead and go to the servers. Actually, let's go to server slash app index. All right, let's go to server slash index. And we need to go to the controller that's responsible for creating this product. So we're going to install a package called Multer which is going to allow us to process that image. Because by default, I don't think Express knows how to process um, an upload that has an image. And again, we might have to change this to like a multi-part upload. Um, but let's just, uh, let's just go to NPM and type in Multer and try to find that Multer package. So Multer is responsible for handling multi-part form data. So typically, if you have to upload an image with your JSON, you have to do like a multi-part upload so that the browser knows how to parse and like consume that image. So I'm gonna go ahead and install this library here. And let's go to our bash terminal, make sure that we're in the server directory and I'm gonna run that. That should run. And while it's running, we can go ahead and use it. So to use this, you basically include or require Multer and then you make an upload thing, whatever that is. So let's just go ahead and do that. I'll just put it up here. So we'll require Multer and then we're going to make an, alter, an upload middleware. I believe this is like a middleware function. And we're going to put this in a public folder or we could put it in an images folder, whatever, whatever works for you. And we are going to basically use that middleware. So if you keep on reading through the docs, you can see that they are able to basically process that by putting this middleware on top of whatever function or right before their controller. The doc file is in the avatar. So let's try doing this one. And we're going to put that in front of the create products controller. And we're going to change this to image. So basically what this is saying is assume that there's a, a value that comes over in the request with the key of image. So if we go back to our UI, I'll show you what that means. So right now we named it file. I'm probably gonna rename it. Let's just name this file so it's consistent. And what this allows us to do is if I go back to my controller and just print out what the request is. Uh, so console log rec dot body. I think there's rec dot files. Remember, always go back to the docs and read. So it says rec dot file will be your actual image. So let's print out what file is, let's print out what image is. Let's try this one more time. It's probably gonna fail because again, I believe I have to like refactor the front end to do a multi-part. Uh, let's do 199 or 122. Let's click on those eggs again. And let's click submit and see what happens. So this is doing a request to the back end. We go over here, we see that we just get a file with a path. So this is not what we want. The file is still undefined here. And the reason this is undefined is because we haven't refactored the front end to do something called a multi-part upload. So let's go back to the create products page. Let's find the create product JSX, which is this one. And in order to change this to a multi-part upload, I think what we could do is just find Axios here and we need to change this a little bit. Honestly, the easiest thing to do is Google this. So I'm gonna say Axios multi-part upload with 
file. Go to the first stack overflow because we like honestly we don't have this all memorized. So let's see what they do. So yeah, I've done something like this before where you actually have to create a form data object. And let's see. Date of file. E.target.files of zero. Yeah, there's a little hack that you kind of have to do here. So we are going to basically do a couple of things. First of all, we are going to copy some of this code. You know what, there might be a better way to do this. Let me just make sure I'm not like doing something that's not really efficient. Yeah, it looks like everyone uses form data. All right, let's see if we can do this without like getting super confused. So let's paste this in. We need to make a form data object. This is something that's built into browsers. But the reason we're doing this is because we need to actually append like the file. So we can say form.file and we're going to refactor this to actually have the real file instead of that one thing. But we also need to append some other stuff. I'm going to say form data append. Um, what else do we have here? We have like name, cost, and description. There might be a better way to do this, but I'm just going to do what I know off the top of my head. So description, name, and then this could be cost. So we're basically atten attaching those three metadata fields, name, description, and cost. And then we're attaching the file. So after you do that, you can actually do an Axios post to our URL, which happens to be this. And but I, I think just basically doing our weight on it. And then we could do all the same logic. So I think we also need to make sure that we have the headers passed in. So let's actually look at this. I think we just need to make sure that we have headers defined. So I'm going to do this. Very similar to what it was before. Let me kind of hide that so you can see what's going on here. <clears throat> all right, what am I missing? All right, again, this is kind of hacky. There's probably a better way to do this. But let's just see if this does what we want. Um, before, oh, oh, I see what they're doing. I copied code and I didn't really look at it, but make sure I'm just going to copy this headers here and I'm going to, I don't like doing stuff like this where the config files separate. If you're not using it anywhere else, just put it directly in the function call because it's easier to like know where it's being used. All right, what is this complaining about? I need to put a comma there. Go ahead and do this. All right, so I think we're almost there. Now the next thing we need to do is we need to, this method, update form value, this actually needs to grab the file if a file exists. You see here in this stack overflow, they're saying you can grab e.target.files of zero. So we can make a new one called like update form file value, and then we can say e.target dot files dot zero and let's see if this is gonna work so it's just a little like a different way that we have to set the file directly on the form object and state but we can instead use that method down here so instead of calling update form value I'm gonna say update form file value and yeah let's just let's just give this a whirl and see what happens so going back to our UI we are going to just type some stuff in going to select that file here and it crashed so let's figure out why it crashed the input element accepts a file name which may only be programmatically set to the empty string um maybe we don't want to put a value there i don't know this is how i debug stuff sometimes this is like i don't know if this is a good way but i like to just using my intuition, tried to comment stuff out. Yeah, that was the issue. I'm trying to like set value to a form, but I think this is actually like an object and not a string, so this crashes. But I think this will work. Let's just try to do the request here. Click Submit. Let's look at this real quick and verify some things. So inside of the request headers, you'll see that we do have the bear token, so that's good. It's always good to double check these things and make sure that you're not getting tripped up. And you see that we are doing a multi-part form. So here, this is a multi-part. 
And down here, you can see that we have a binary file. We have a cost, a name, and a description. So let's go back to our server. And now you'll see that we actually have the metadata. And then we also have the object. All right, so we can actually start processing that. Um, and you'll see that we actually have an images folder here. Let me just look at this. And if we actually like put an extension on this, um, I don't know what that was. Is that a JPEG? Yeah. So if we put a JPEG extension on this, you'll see that the image actually shows up in our VS Code previewer. So everything's working fine. You might have to like do something in the back end to like change that image. But yeah, this is how you basically set up multi-part upload. It's kind of a pain, but once you have it set up, you can easily just copy and paste this code or make helper functions to do this. And if you know a better way to do it, let me know, but I'm just doing the way I've done it before. Um, but yeah, the next step is we actually need to store the name of that file. So I'm gonna say file name. Um, let's see where we could do this. File name is gonna be stored. So let's go to our product model. And what we need to do is basically a, uh, let's just put like image and that could be a string. So now our model is going to store the image. And what we're going to do is we are going to go back to the controller and we're going to make sure that we set that image somewhere. So everything works as before we're setting rec body, but now what we need to do is we need to set that image as well. So let's just do a spread operator on that. I'm going to say image is equal to rec .file .file name. Um, and I think that should do it. So that'll basically say like whenever we create a product or update a product, it's going to store that image ID in Mongo. So we know which image to load later on. Now, the next step is we don't actually have a way to access this image. Like we don't have an endpoint for downloading this JPEG. Um, the fastest way to do this is inside your server. You could set up in a, a static hosting. So I could say like, up the top of here, I'm going to say app.use. I'm going to say express.static. And I'm going to say dot slash images. So what this is going to do is take this images folder and host it at port 8080 so that anyone can go to that image. And the reason we're doing that is so that the UI can actually download and view that image. So let's try to take this the next step. Let's go and verify if I try to load this up in the browser. Let me change this back to what it was and see if that actually does something. If I go to localhost 8080 slash that ID, notice that it actually tried to download that file. So that's pretty cool. I think what we're gonna have to do though is we need to probably make sure we add an extension because it shouldn't have downloaded. It should have just like displayed it. So I will probably have to figure out how to do that with Malter. Um, Let's see, Malter. Let me see if I can find if they have an extension somewhere. Each file will be given a random name so it doesn't include any file extension. Malter will not append any file extension for you. Your function should return a file name complete with a file extension. Um, so let's try to figure out how to actually do this. There's probably a way to like make it add an extension. You know, when in doubt, go to Stack Overflow. So I'm gonna say Stack Overflow, Node, Malter, um, Extension. So it looks like they have to provide file name. I'll probably do something like this. Malter disk storage, storage. Just look at these different examples. It seems like they all use multi disk storage. They give it a location, kind of hoping there's an easier way to do this instead of having to define the whole disk storage stuff. But some of these people are using date.now. I don't think that's a good idea. Two people upload the same file at the same time, you're going to have the same date.now probably. Um, short ID. Use nano ID. Let 
when was this? Another thing, the good, the good thing to do is check. This is in 19. So let's go back to the docs. I think we have a good idea of what we might be able to do. But let's go back to the docs here and see. You can give it a file name. Wait, let's see. The name of the file within the destination. So you can do something like this. Okay, well, whatever. Let's just um, just copy this real quick. Yeah, so the whole reason we're doing this is because we need to basically make sure that extension is added to the file. And we're going to just basically take in this whole thing. And instead of saying Malter here, we're going to say Storage. So we're going to make sure that the storage is set to... Okay, how do they do that? Storage. Okay, they do this. And then we could say, make sure this is dot slash images. This is basically how you specify where it's going to store the file. So we wanted to have it stored in dot slash images and then the file name. Right now, I guess we could just keep this. Hopefully this will work. Um, but let's actually try this and let's go back to our controller and make sure we print out what file is. And hopefully file name has that extension now. Go back to our UI. Let's go ahead and click around some. Add a description, add an eggs image, click submit, go back. You'll see that it didn't actually add an extension because I don't think that code we copied even does anything with the extension. Uh, yeah, this is just adding like a unique suffix to it. So let's go back to that stack overflow and just copy this. Okay, so sorry, I'm just, this is how I debug. This is actually like real coding. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just trying stuff out. Um, it looks like this might work good. We just need to install this nano ID. So I'm going to say install save nan nano ID. And we're going to make sure we import that here. What is meme types? Do we need to install that too? Well, we might have to install this as well. So let's just install this. And again, there's like so many different examples on this Stack Overflow page, but I'm just going with the one that I think might work best. We're not sure if this is going to work good, but we are going to basically um, try it out. This is the only way to get good at coding. You have to try stuff, watch it fail, try some new stuff, watch it fail. Um, so just get into that habit. So we have that installed and set up. We took this code example, which should hopefully put the extension. Remember, the whole reason that we like we're going back and redoing that is because there was no extension still. So let's go back and upload a file. It should basically have a random UID with JPEG at the end. So let's go to our server and it crashed. Uh, so let's see, nano ID is not a function. So I would need to make sure uh, the issue that we're having now is because they gave us examples with importing, but again, we're not using TypeScript or anything. We're using Node. So we need to say const um, how do you do this? I forget. Nano ID I might have to print out what nano ID is here. Okay, so I think I need to do this. Let's also print out what mime is. And mime, or meme, looks like it just has a bunch of things. Oh, it has a ton of things. Okay, let's just make sure that we're doing the mime extension. So let's do console.log mime.extension. I'm just debugging to make sure that these things actually exist when I restart my thing. So yeah, this is defined now. Nano ID should be a function. I think we should be good and we shouldn't get a crash anymore. So let's go back to the UI, click submit, hit the UI. Notice that we have a file name here with this extension. And if we go back to our network tab and we hit the dashboard, now remember the dashboard is going to fetch all the products from Mongo. So if we look at the last product we added, it now has an image with an extension. So we did all that work just so that we can have a random ID with an image on it. And what we're trying to do is make sure that if we go to localhost 8080 and hit that, some eggs show up. All right, does that, that make sense? I know I kind of jumped around. I'll try to do a recap real quick. So let's see if I can recap this good. So on the front end, we have that crate controller page. Oh wait, crate products page. That is basically refactored to use something called form data so that we can do a multi-part upload to the back end. The reason we're doing this is because you can't upload files or images 
just doing normal application slash JSON. You have to use multi-part slash form data. And we had to do some refactoring here because we have to set the file onto the form in state a little bit differently. We have to do e.target files of zero instead of doing this. So I made a different function to allow us to do that. And then when we click on save or submit, that's hitting our backend, which we refactored to basically use this Malter middleware to grab the file from the multi-part upload, which happens to use this storage object to like pretty much tell Malter where to save the file and what to do and how to name it. So this is just some stuff that's used for like describing where the file goes and how the file name is set up. And then we use that storage class to create a upload middleware. And then in our create products controller, we are able to access that file name on rec.file. And we are basically using the file name to store it in Mongo. So the whole circle is almost complete. What we need to do now is on the products page, we need to display the image. So if we go to this card, remember we're showing like this image up here. Instead of saying source of placeholder, what we can do now is we can say, um, I think it's just HTTP, let's see, HTTP localhost 8080 slash product.image. All right, so now the eggs show up for those images, for those products, and everything is working. So that was a lot of work. I think I'm going to wrap this part up, but what we could do is basically do that same logic for updating existing ones that are missing images. Remember, this page doesn't have any images or the ability to upload them. And we could probably do something with like fixing the width and height of these because right now they're pretty big. We might need to display more cards on the page so they're not so huge. But yeah, I hope that was a good overview of all the things that we uh, needed to do. So stick around for the next part of the series. I'm going to probably just continue to do that with the edit button. And then I think I'm going to start doing some code refactoring to make our code cleaner and then start working on the checkout button, the checkout page and stuff like that. So all right, happy coding. Stick around.